All right, hey there, AP Physics. Here to talk about harmonic motion today. Um, I'm gonna jump right into it so we can rock through these. Uh, the notes for this unit are fairly short, and this will be a quicker unit than we've covered for some of our other ones. So it uh, should be pretty easy to get us going. Um, a reminder, and you can read the big ideas here. We've used them in, in uh, every single one of these in some point, maybe not for every unit, but at least in some units up to this point. So they are all things that should be familiar um, with you and with what we've studied to this point. Just realize that we're going to be looking at big ideas one, two, three, and 4 for this unit that we're going to be covering next. Um, let's talk about what harmonic motion is. So simple harmonic motion, um, often abbreviated as SHM, this is a type of periodic motion or oscillation motion where the restoring force, and so this is the, the nitty gritty of it, the restoring force is directly proportional to the displacement and acts in the direction opposite to the displacement. So explained simply in very short terms here, there's a repeating motion due to a restoring force. If we look at our pendulum right here, if we pick our pendulum up to this point and release it, it's gonna fall down. And it's gonna have some velocity down here, right? And that velocity is gonna cause it to move back up to the other side and then it's gonna fall back down again. And it's going to change back and forth. We looked at something very similar. We talked about conservation of energy and how gravitational potential energy changes down to kinetic energy and then back and so forth and so on. Gravity is the restoring force here that causes this repeating motion. A similar thing can be looked at in springs. So if a spring were just hanging here, um, it wouldn't necessarily be gravity that would be causing the restoring force, but if we pull down on this object that's hanging from a spring, then it would go through a similar repeating motion due to the restoring force of the spring and Hooke's Law. And so a quick reminder of what Hooke's Law is amidst the force in springs. We did cover this in dynamics, but that's been a long time at this point. So Hooke's Law um, refers to the spring constant corresponding to the source of periodic motion in this case. So some springs are going to be stronger than others and thus that k value will be stronger in them and so we'll have a different restoring force in the spring that will be repeating over and over here um, the assumption here for simple harmonic motion is that there's no friction to slow the motion down and we're going to talk about that a little bit later here we'll talk about what's called damping forces but realize this is one of those things that we have to uh, consider to be negligible in what we do, but uh, that does actually you know, exist in the real world. So let's talk about what oscillations are. And we gotta define a couple terms here before we can continue on with the rest of this. So an oscillation is the regular variation in magnitude or position around a central point. So the pendulum swings, comes back, one full oscillation. An object hanging from a spring goes down, comes up, goes back to the starting point. One full oscillation. It is one full cycle of this repeating process. A good way to think about it, if we go right back to our last unit that was uh, gravitation and circular motion, it's one revolution. It's the same idea as one revolution is an oscillation, but because it doesn't actually revolve all the way around, we call it an oscillation here instead. Now that oscillation has a period in the same way that one full revolution had a period. And this is the time required for one full oscillation, still measured in seconds, just like it was for circular motion. The frequency is still the inverse of the period, measured in hertz, and it is the number of cycles in one second, just as we defined in the last unit. And then the amplitude, this is a new one, the amplitude is the maximum point within an oscillation. And this is measured in meters. So you see A right down there. This would be the amplitude. So if we graphed this right here, and we'll look at what that, how we would do something like that in a second. But if we graphed this motion, we'd have its highest point right here. And that's its highest point. And then it would go down to its lowest point there, all the way down to the lowest point. And then it would come back up to the highest point. It would come back up here. So we get essentially a sine or a cosine wave as a graph if we graph the motion of an object in harmonic motion. The same thing would happen with a spring. That amplitude would be the maximum point in the oscillation. It's going to be measured in meters. It is going to be a measure of distance. So a simple pendulum. Forces acting on this. There's a couple forces and you see them down below. There's a tension in the spring and then there's weight. Force of gravity pulling it downwards, right? Um, at certain points, these two are going to be equal. When we're at the very bottom of a pendulum swing, the tension up will equal gravity pulling down. 
but because it already has a velocity, it will continue to move on. And so there will be an acceleration directed in different directions here that will cause the mass to continue moving back and forth. So the acceleration of the pendulum at its maximum is in the direction opposite of the motion at the highest point. So we see this pendulum here swung from this bottom point up to here. But it has an acceleration right here that has slowed it down because it's going in towards the center. And that's measurable. We see that right there. And that acceleration is what has caused it to go from its max velocity here to its minimum velocity there and then begin to speed back up as it goes down. And we see the same thing over here. I just think seeing this numerous different ways or, or with slightly different label diagrams can be very helpful here. Now to see it actually in practice. So I'm going to let this go for a minute here and let this just kind of start to sink in but i want to talk about what's really happening here okay so i'm actually going to start by looking at the right and if we look at the point when that pendulum is right along that blue dotted line then we have the tension up equaling the weight down and we have essentially if we paused it right there what would look like an equilibrium state but we have to take into account the fact that there's an acceleration at that point too okay and we see the change in acceleration as this direction is also changing and how that's affecting the velocity. We see all of that happening right there. Now the maximum acceleration is going to be at the maximum height because that's when it's going to have also the maximum X component to this tension. So if I were to try to pause this right here when it's at its max point, then we would have the maximum X component either inward, either each depending on which side it's on, the maximum X component to this tension force and thus the maximum acceleration. Whereas when they're in equilibrium, I have just the acceleration in towards the center, similar to our centripetal acceleration because all it's doing then at the bottom is changing direction. Now we'll do a lot with, uh, with pendulums. We'll see all this happening a lot. But as you see this going over and over again and we see this, this continued oscillation, this continued periodic motion, hopefully that helps it sink in just a little bit. So if we were to take an object and spin it in a circle, and we see right here, so I've got what I've got here, I've got four lights, okay? Well, let's address the top part first. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uniform circular motion and simple harmonic motion. I want to make a connection between them since we just got through our uniform circular motion. So a constant uniform circular motion produces an output similar to simple harmonic motion, okay? We just saw how that can form that sine cosine wave, right? But if I have four lights right here, and they're shining here and they're causing this, this film to be blue, unless it's blocked, in which case it's white underneath here, okay? This object, as it spins around in a circle, moves from this spot out to the outside here, or the maximum spot right here, down back into the middle, or the central point right there, and then out to the other side, which is the maximum point on this side, and continues to spin, and thus continues to create this wave function as a graph. We'll do an activity where you'll see that actually happen here. So we'll do a lot more with, with this as we keep going if this seems like a confusing concept at this point. Now there is something called a damping force that could slow this process down long term, right? We've had friction forces, we've had air resistance. Damping in the sense of simple harmonic motion really is just referring to the combination of those things. Anything that slows down this process of simple harmonic motion is considered a damping force. So we see right here, it's a decrease in the amplitude of an oscillation as a result of energy being drained from the system to overcome frictional and otherwise, you know, resistive forces. Now, we don't just say friction or air resistance in this case, because depending on the spring, there could be internal forces within a spring that could cause this to change as well. There could be a lot of things present that could be damping forces. But we see the space between these amplitudes, the frequency down there at the bottom, that's going to stay the same. It's the amplitude that's going to decrease. So the amount of time it takes to go from side to side is going to be the same. It's just not going to go quite as high. And we'll see that in practice as we get through all of this stuff. Um, we're going to go ahead and just say that damping forces are going to be something that we're not going to calculate for this unit. And I've showed you the wonderful math down here at the bottom right as to why that is, right? So a dampened pendulum, this does have a reduction in the force driving it. So we see an undamped pendulum here with no damping forces um, is this full F. And then a damped pendulum, a, a pendulum that is experiencing damping forces, is going to be that F that drives it, that weight 
uh, minus whatever the damping forces are. So because it is a very complicated and very um, specific calculation in order to find out what these forces actually are that slows this down, we're not going to do it because we don't do all these fun little things that are the calculus here. We're going to ignore those and we're just going to say ignore damping forces and calculate things from there with the assumption that a pendulum or a spring that is oscillating would never stop. All right. So the last couple things we need to look at. Uh, this is the period of a pendulum. Now this seems odd because it doesn't matter what the mass at the end of the pendulum is. If we take a look here for the period of a pendulum as it swings from side to side, what's going to be important in determining how long it takes to get from one side to the other is the length of the pendulum, right? And that length is gonna be constant regardless of which one of these we look at, either side here or that central point where it's all the way down at the equilibrium position. The length of the pendulum will be the same for all of them. And gravity. Our gravitational um, acceleration constant that we use for here on Earth. Those are the only things that are going to matter. We will do a, a number of labs where we'll test this and we'll make sure that this works. But the mass of the bob at the end, the bob being the object hanging at the end of a pendulum, is irrelevant when it comes to determining the period of the pendulum. Now, going over to a spring here, there's a couple things I want to look at as far as the spring. First, let's look at some of these different forces that could be present here. So what I've got right here is, is this one I want to look at first, these two, okay? I'm going to look on the right side first. We're going to start with that, where we are at this beginning point, okay? X equals zero point. At that point, the only forces acting on this object that's attached to the spring is the normal force pointing up and the weight pulling down. And that's the case for both here, even though we see a negative velocity in this one and a positive velocity in this one. Now what's happened is we started at X equals zero here at that same point and we pulled our object back to be at this point right here. Now we know the spring then is going to try to pull it back in the other direction and thus we see a spring force here. So we pull the object from X equals zero to this new position, X equals capital X, so there's a force that's going to pull it back. We release it, and so it has a negative velocity. Okay? Negative velocity once we release it. It moves past this initial point here where there's no forces at all moving in the x direction, but it has this velocity, so it continues to move past it and compress this spring here to a position of x equals negative x. And again, this is assuming no friction and no damping forces. It will move to this X equals negative capital X here, where we will have a maximum force that is a compression force pushing back out from the spring because the spring was compressed that will move it to the right. It will pause briefly. It will be pushed to the right. So then it will move back to our X equals zero point with a positive velocity, continue on past there to our X equals capital X point again, and then continue to move back and forth because we originally stretch the spring out and then it moves back and forth in that oscillating fashion as well, okay? Now, whether we compress it horizontally like this or we have a spring at a natural length that we hang a mass from now, and now it's at this length, we could pull this mass down, release it, and it would oscillate up and down. So the same type thing would happen right here, okay? The period of oscillation for this spring is seen down here at the bottom. Now, in this case, the mass is relevant, and it's just going to be the mass and the spring constant that we need to determine the period of oscillation for a spring as it has, has a mass on it, whether that be a hanging spring or a horizontal spring that's moving an object left to right. The difference here being the natural position of a spring, really right here, you see this equilibrium point where the weight pulling down. So if we just hang a mass from this spring, we have our equilibrium point where mg equals ks. We could use this knowing the mass of this object and gravity. Obviously, we're here on Earth. Um, we could find then the total weight pulling down and the displacement of the spring from its original position. This was Hooke's law that we did back in dynamics to find our spring constant, which we could have here. We've known the mass in order to find that. And then thus we could stretch this down and find the oscillation of the spring as it goes up and down from there. Okay, that will be irrelevant to how far we stretch the spring. All that will matter in this case is the mass that's hung and the spring constant. So I hope this gave us at least a good introduction to what we're going to be looking at for harmonic motion. 
A reminder that we had our four big ideas, and we'll get much more in depth into all of this as the unit continues.